number is 510-848-4425. That's 510-848-4425. And you'll have a chance to talk with us because we are live today on Education Today. We've talked a lot about testing on this program. A new piece of news, California new lawmakers have proposed to suspend the STAR tests, which are the tests that have been recently given in California, and instead to use an advanced version of a common core test, a test on the common core standards. Their argument is that students are preparing to deal with the common core and that a test, uh, kind of a pre-test or a, a pilot test on the Common Core standards would be more useful than the standardized test that's currently given. As you will know, if you've listened previously to this program, there is controversy about the Common Core. Many educators are happier with the Common Core than they have been with the previous basis for standardized test because it's more conceptual and more broad and people feel that they can teach uh, better to it. On the other hand, there are critics who argue that this type of standardization across the country is simply an excuse for more tests and for companies making more money off of testing kids just on a different basis. The discussion is important because of something that people call the privatization of education. And I think sometimes the public is not completely clear what progressives mean when we talk about privatization. And so people say, well, I don't think most of the kids are going to private school. They're mostly going to public school. Privatization isn't whether you go to private or public school. It's whether companies are able to take tax dollars intended for public schools out of the public arena and spend them on profit-making activities like creating more and more tests. And what many of us have argued over a period of time is that the purpose of the tests is not really helpful to the students. Instead, it's a profit-making venture sold by an argument that really isn't true, which is that students will do better if they're tested frequently. So uh, the Common Core debate will continue. Uh, The curriculum is supported by some progressive advocates and educators, but there is the question of the test, which is accompanying it. Uh, And California has now decided to use a pilot version of that rather than the old test. So um, that's important for people to know. On the higher education front, a report from the University of Virginia has outlined how spending on higher education financially benefits the state. This may provide some ammunition for those who want states, governments to spend money on higher education, which has in some cases been reduced. A study by the University of Virginia's Weldon Cooper Center for Public Service shows that the state's economy receives $17 in new economic activity and the state government gets $1.29 in additional tax revenue for every dollar spent on Virginia's public university system. So if you're an advocate for colleges, there's a a study for you that might be helpful. Um, If we've wondered whether the grossest forms of racism still exist in American schools, we have an example from Tulsa, Oklahoma, that will break your heart. A charter school sent a seven-year-old child home for having dreads. The school policy says that afros, dreads, and mohawks are, quote, distracting. This is incredible, and the picture showing the child's tears should move all of us to action on the racism that still exists everywhere in our schools. This little girl should not have to have suffered through that indignity. Although there's great unanimity that childhood obesity is a problem in the U.S., there is less agreement about what to do about it. Some districts have started to send notices to parents that their children's body mass index is too high. Very young children. But experts on reducing childhood obesity are criticizing this approach, saying that it may actually increase bullying and the negative feelings that children often have when it comes to, which may lead to their overeating in the first place. Nurse Doyle Hayes, writing in the Huffington Post, who is an expert on obesity, indicates that weight stigma and weight bullying are serious problems and that having parents receive some sort of notice about their child's weight may just cause them anxiety. They may not necessarily deal with it that well in relation to the child, and they could uh, lead to even greater 
uh, eating problems in the future. In fact, there are some studies that indicate that that is already happening. So uh, the critics are arguing that the approaches need to be well-funded and well-thought-through uh, so that we don't just increase the misery that children may already suffer if they are overweight. Now, on the subject of about which we'll be talking to our caller today, a law has passed by the state leg- legislature, AB 540, which indicates that undocumented students should be able to attend college and pay in-state tuition if they meet certain, certain conditions. This law, AB 540, represents a, a break in the kind of consistently anti-immigrant legislation that has been passing around the country. This law says instead, instead of additional anti-immigrant uh, action, this law, AB 540, represents a considerable cost savings to those undocumented students and their families who qualify. So, for example, uh, the total average fees for an undergraduate student at the University of California in one recent year, if they were resident, were $9,285, still a lot of money, I know, a lot more than some of us paid when we went to the University of California some years ago. Uh, but this would be $32,000 for a non-resident student. So clearly, an immigrant family would be better able to pay the resident tuition than the non-resident tuition. At the California State University, undergraduate students pay $4,000 per year if they are resident and 11000 if they are non-resident. And at the California Community Colleges, the annual resident fee for someone who does live in the state of California and is qualified is $480 compared to $3,360 for non-residents. So AB 540 is a very important step to achieving education for undocumented students. Now, many of us have great critiques of the whole approach to uh, young people who come from other countries to the U.S., Um, Some of us want to point back to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, which unfairly uh, took this property from Mexican people a long time ago. And we want to question whether there should be even terms like undocumented, illegal, alien and so on. Perhaps we're all alien from somewhere. But I think a lot of activists want to work on the issues one at a time and uh, feel that we're not going to win the whole battle right away. And so uh, this matter of children being able to be educated when they reach college age is an important victory. Some of the qualifications that the young people have to have in order to meet this, the criteria to receive resident tuition and as opposed to non-resident tuition is that they have to have attended a California high school. They have to have a, or they have to have uh, attained a GED. So they have to have been at a California high school for three years or more, and they have to have graduated from high school or have attained a GED or passed the California high school proficiency exam. And they have to register, be currently enrolled in an accredited institution of higher education. And then they have to file a plan saying they're going to file for residency And uh, those are the basic qualifications. Now, one of our great California education activists working on immigration issues is Dennis Lopez, who has been raising the issue of how we make this law into a reality for young people by trying to make sure that some districts in the Southern California area actually implement the law. And we're going to be talking to him today uh, finding out from him how he proposes that the law really make an effect in the lives of young people and uh, what we might be able to do to help. So I want to introduce our listeners to Dennis Lopez, uh, someone whose organizing skills I greatly admire. Welcome to Education Today. Hello, uh, Dr. Kelly, uh, Dr. Kelly. It's great to be here. 
Great. Thank you for being with us. And I want to tell our listeners again that in a few minutes you'll have a chance to call in and talk with Dennis about this issue or talk with us about other issues that are important to you. Our number is 510-848-4425. You're listening to Education Today on KPFA, and uh, this is Kitty Kelly Epstein, your host. So, Dennis, I wanted to ask you, I've kind of described the law to uh, people um what what it provides for but the fact that that law exists doesn't necessarily mean that kids are going to have the information or the wherewithal to actually utilize it so i wonder how you propose that families will get the information to know that their children are eligible and be able to actually utilize the law and should school districts have some kind of responsibility for that outreach yes thank you um I'd like to take one step back and mention that the United States Supreme Court decided in uh, Plyler versus Doe uh, in 1982 that undocumented immigrant children have a right to a public school education from kindergarten through the 12th grade in the United States of America. That's in every state, of course. And um, in, uh, it was 2001 that the legislature passed AB 540, and it was signed into law by then-Governor Gray Davis. But it's been in effect since January 1, 2002. So this is a law that's now um, uh, over 10 years old, 11 years old. It also was able to pass muster with the California State Supreme Court, who ruled unanimously that AB 540 uh, should be upheld. There are two other laws that were um, passed by the legislature and signed into law by Governor Brown in 2011, those two laws are known as the California Dream Act laws. The first, AB 130, enables undocumented immigrant students, including those who qualify for, or actually they must be those who qualify for AB 540 that you described in detail, those students um, are eligible now for private uh, scholarships that are controlled by public colleges and universities, the community colleges, the UC, the UC uh, campuses, and the California State University campuses. The other Dream Act law, AB 131, also passed in 2011, signed into law by the governor that year, and uh, coming to full effect in the case of AB 131 in January 2012. That law en- enables AB 540 qualified students to be eligible for the Cal Grant programs and for all other state forms of financial aid. Now, this includes uh, students who are undocumented immigrants, but uh, and as such, they're not eligible for federal financial aid. So your question, uh, and I'm sorry to have to take a couple steps back and, and give you that intro, but your question as to uh, how uh, students and how parents uh, can uh, have access to that information, I would refer you to and your listeners to the, the website for the California Student Aid Commission. That's the California Student Aid Commission. They can Google that and get that website. And there they can find information in English and Spanish on AB 540 and the California Dream Act laws and the California Dream application. That is the application where AB 540 students, uh, that AB 540 students utilize to determine their eligibility uh, for whether it's a private scholarships controlled by the public universities or the state uh, financial aid programs. So that's one, um, that is one very important source of information in English and in Spanish. Secondly, um, there is a wonderful organization in the Bay Area it's called Educators for Fair Consideration. There you can find a, a host of, uh, of, of uh, downloadable um, uh, information uh, that can help students and counselors. One last note before I turn it back over to you, uh, Dr. Kelly Epstein, and that is that um, local um, uh, organizations and individuals can do, uh, they can go to local school boards, point out the Tyler versus Doe decision, point out the, that AB 540 has been lost since 2002, point out the California Dream Act, our California state law, and that um, 
Now it's up to the districts and the school sites to inform parents and students uh, about uh, these laws. And, and there should be a strategic effort in that regard because, of course, you know, we're talking about immigrant parents and immigrant students. Uh, so there's a lot that can be done, and we're seeing it done here in Southern California. So I want to thank you for those details because if people do want to help with this effort, um, they need to have the information in a written form. So the California Student Aid Commission, and can you say the name of the group again? The, the group in the, the San Francisco Bay Area is one of the best in the country, and it's called Educators for Fair Consideration. Educators for Fair Consideration. So right. um, a light, nice neutral sounding organization um uh, with the, some good good political strategizing there uh with the creation of that name so people can help by doing those things and i when i learned about your work dennis i um contacted a couple of school districts uh press offices to ask them what the districts were doing uh, to provide the kind of information that uh, young people need. I have not received any responses yet. I wonder if that means that they're not doing much and maybe they'll start, hurry up quick and do something. I don't know. But uh, hopefully I will hear back from the districts in the Bay Area and, and uh, we can report that on our next show, what what it is that they're doing. We, since we have a lot of activists among our listeners, I hope people will take this issue on and whatever city or district you're in, uh, go to a school board meeting or email some board members and ask them what actions the district is taking. Even if they're doing a little bit of something, probably some public scrutiny of it would encourage them to do more. So, Dennis, are there people who are doing, I know you mentioned one organization, but are there people that are really doing the kind of organizing that you think needs to be done in order to make um youngsters know about this and how big do you think the problem is i mean do do most kids know and their families know and it's just a few who don't or is there a widespread need for more information well um i I would say basically there's two general areas that activists and concerned uh, folks can uh, focus on one is looking at uh, school districts and seeing what the secondary schools middle schools and high schools are doing to inform uh, immigrant parents about uh, the California Dream Act laws and um, AB 540. Uh, and, and also, they, they should review their procedures, not only in providing information to parents, but in, 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 in assuring that their staff and faculty that, that deal with uh, immigrant students, that, that, that serve immigrant students, are themselves uh, fully uh, trained. So um, they should seek out this information, again, from the California Student Commission and from Educators for Fair Consideration, and make sure all their counselors and uh, others, like AVID and other programs that serve students, uh, that they're fully uh, briefed and trained on, on these laws and, and how they're being implemented. So there's this, the first thing is the strategy that districts and school sites have to give this information. The second thing is that um, there can be, uh, like uh, in a community called Moreno Valley, um, in 2009 and 2011, Spanish-speaking parents organized what they called El Foro Educativo, which was a volunteer effort where uh, Spanish-speaking parents wrote to vice presidents of uh, local UC and Cal State and community college and school district and, and said that they were organizing a community forum and ask that each of those entities I just mentioned provide Spanish-speaking professional, professionals who are expert in admissions and in financial aid. And on both, uh, in both cases, in, uh, in Moreno Valley in 2009 and 2011, there were over 400 Spanish-speaking parents that attended, and they were able to get uh, information to oral presentations to panels of AB540 students and parents of AB540 students that showed how those parents and students accessed um, what was available then. What's different now is that we have the full implementation of the California Dream Act law. So now these students can be um, able to get, uh, as I mentioned, the private funds controlled by the public colleges and universities and the, the state funds, uh, the Cal Grant and other state financial aid programs. But uh, I think you applied in one of your um, questions, how do parents know? 
So parents know because the school districts can and should implement effective uh, practices for the full and efficient implementation of AB 540 and the California Dream Act laws. And then local community groups, church groups, or a combination thereof can um, uh, ask the, the um, UC, CSU, and community colleges and school districts to come to a, uh, a community forum where, uh, where uh, people with the appropriate language uh, uh, skills and expertise uh, from those uh, educational institutions can uh, provide specific information on how, at the local level, um, these students and parents can apply for uh, um, these, these uh, financial aid programs and for admissions. So these processes are complicated. They can be confusing for people. It's it's hard for English speaking uh, students who are already citizens to um, to get financial aid often just because the whole process is so difficult. So actually, I think all students need a, additional assistance and especially those students who are having to get, navigate a whole new set of laws and requirements. Um, so Dennis has given us the name of one organization. I will also give my email address in case people want to be referred uh, to some additional. Uh, so it's kkepstein at gmail.com kkepstein at gmail.com if people uh, want some more information about how you can get your own district organized to provide this information because it's a great victory for the um, movement of for the Latino movement and the movement of people for fairer sort of immigration policy to have these laws be passed. So we want to take advantage of that movement. Our telephone number is 510-848-4425. It's 510-848-4425 if you want to call in to talk about this or any other issues. Um, so you, Dennis, have been uh, speaking at uh, school board meetings in your area, I know, and uh, and are you getting a good response? Do you feel like you, you mentioned some organizing that sounds extremely successful from a few years ago, and do you feel like the organizing around this is going well? Also, both this issue and also other immigration rights issues. Well, it happens that in several communities here in Southern California, the, um, the Spanish-speaking immigrant community is very well organized. They have to be. There are occasions, you know, we've had more deportations uh, uh, in the Obama administration than uh, in any other administration. So the, there's, there's immigration rates that happen, and parents form sometimes uh, uh, phone trees to uh, inform the community uh, where these immigration rates are happening. So there's, a, there's a, uh, an organized um, effort uh, of mutual support among many of the Spanish-speaking parents. There also is one of the most dynamic social movements in the history of the United States of America, and that's the movement of the dreamers. These are students who take their, their name from the DREAM Act uh, on the federal level, and that's the, um, uh, the law that was first proposed in 2001 in Congress by Republican Senator Orrin Hatch and by um, Democratic Senator Richard Durbin. And uh, that law has been stalled several times in Congress because of the anti-immigrant politics that are uh, uh, prevalent in, in many sectors in the United States. So these, these parents, out of sheer daily necessity, uh, and their children, the dreamers, um, they, 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 out of necessity, have, have organized. Um, I also would like to refer you and your, um, your listeners to the uh, June 25th edition of Time magazine, June 25th, 2012. There's a Pulitzer Prize-winning uh, reporter, Jose Luis Vargas, a uh, Filipino uh, man who uh, grew up in, in the Bay Area, who was on part of the Pulitzer Prize winning team that, um, that covered for the Washington Post the tragedy in Virginia Tech. And um, he's undocumented. And he has come out in a movement, a national movement called Undocumented and Unafraid. Uh, it, it's just incredible. These young people in the tradition of the, of the, of the Freedom Riders, uh, in the South, in the tradition of the uh, lunch counter uh, 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 protesters to to integrate uh, the lunch counters in the South. Uh, the the Dreamers have organized to the extent that the President of the United States 
um, uh, issued a policy called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, that students or individuals who um, uh, have been here, uh, um, they got here before the age of 16, and they're not older than 32. This is according to Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, the, the policy of Barack Obama, that um, those individuals, if they pass a, a, a detailed background check, uh, can qualify to, to apply and to be uh, protected from deportation for two years and to apply for a Social Security card uh, temporarily and to apply for a work permit. Now, this, this is as a result of the organizing of the DREAMers, these young people who are high-achieving students who want to either go into college or serve in the United States uh, Armed Services uh, per the DREAM Act, and uh, that's still not been passed in, 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 in Congress, uh, President Obama has said many times, if it is passed by Congress, he will sign it the next day. But um, uh, so these dreamers, even though the law that they seek has not made it through Congress, they continue to organize, they continue to study, they continue to be dedicated to our country, their country, the only country they ever have known. And these dreamers, are now expanding their com campaign from young people to include uh, the original dreamers, their parents, who um, they understand to have sacrificed everything humanly possible for a better life for them, the children. So this undocumented and unafraid movement, that is why the deferred action was established by Barack Obama. That is why the organization of of the, the California Dream Act uh, was able to happen, and uh, several years ago, AB 540. This dynamic social movement of low-income immigrants who strive to serve our country in the armed services or, or, uh, or stri and strive to go to college, uh, they have made all of this happen. So I'm just simply tapping into those existing networks of students and parents uh, now that we have in the state of California AB 540 and the DREAM Act laws that can yield a, a tangible result in their access to California higher education. So I thank you for giving us that uh, background because, as I said, um, the, uh, the, we have a lot of activists who listen to this program, and everybody, no matter whether they're teacher, parent, student, or whoever, can help with this effort uh, by be making sure that the uh, city that you're in pays attention to the information that young people need and also to our own ability to change uh, attitudes around uh, these issues. Um, in, in future weeks, we will be reporting on uh, some of the issues happening with Oakland and other uh, school districts. Oakland is now responding to a report that came out on the enormous number of African-American kids who are actually arrested at school, not just uh, not just suspended. And uh, the district is trying to deal with that. Um, they have acknowledged some of it and said some of it is accurate. And so we will be talking about that issue also. Um, I also want you to know that um, we uh, have been requested to announce to our audience that the Emiliano Zapata Street Academy, which is a wonderful social justice oriented public school, which has been around for 40 years, is still accepting applications for young people who need a small and friendly high school to go to. Uh, school started a week or two ago, but a lot of times high school students in particular go to high school or they go back to the high school they were in and they find the environment not one that's conducive to their learning because they need a little bit of a smaller space. So you can Google the Emiliano Zapata Street Academy or just Street Academy, Oakland Street Academy, and you'll find information there. Please refer young people who are looking for a small and friendly place to go to school. I want to thank Dennis Lopez for being with us um, and um, I want to thank our board operator Wesley, our producer Jaron Epstein and uh, I'm your host Kitty Kelly Epstein and we will be with you again in a couple of weeks and this is Education Today on KPFA 94.1 FM. Bye bye.
and you're listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, also 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. Stay tuned for cover to 